In the Talmud it is said, I have learned much from my teachers, but from my colleagues I have learned more than from my teachers, but from my students I have learned the most of all. And I abide by that. It is from my students that I have learned the most of all. And beginning in 2004, 2005, just as Iraq was getting pretty nasty, uh, I had the privilege and the honor of teaching at the Marine Corps Command and Staff College in Quantico, Virginia. And I was teaching a workshop very much like this. And during a break, I wandered down to the Marine Corps bookstore and I was delighted to see something in the Marine Corps bookstore called the Commandant's Reading, reading List. And number one, as a, as a teacher, I was quite taken that the Commandant has a reading list. Isn't that cool? Uh, and number two, I started looking at the hundred titles in that reading list, and I discovered at least a third of them were sharply critical of the US military and of the war in Iraq. And I thought it was really cool that the Commandant was having people read books that were critical of the US military and critical of the war in Iraq. But then I noticed that there were some things on that reading list that were unrelated to what was happening in the world that day, but were foundational principles. And one of the things I found, which I'd never known before, is a slim little volume with a civilian title, War Fighting. The Marines will call it MCDP-1. And Marine Corps doctrinal publication number one called War Fighting is in many ways, Colonel, keep me honest here, the first principles of being a Marine. It's the first thing you read when you become a Marine. The foundation, thank you, sir. I, standing in that uh, bookstore, uh, started flipping through it, and I was immediately very excited. I was excited because, remarkably, it's very well written. And I don't expect that from a military manual. Sorry. And, and as I'm reading, I'm saying, this is really well written. Whoever wrote this needs to be acknowledged because it's really compelling stuff. It was essentially close of its distilled into accessible English language stuff. I thought that was really cool, too. The second thing I noticed is it's relatively short. You can read it in an hour. The third thing I noticed is just as with Clausewitz, if you change just a couple of words, you can get a conceptual framework that makes sense of communication. And I embarked on a project to do just that. So I came back to NYU. And I teach a course on communication strategy. It's taught over seven Saturdays from 9 to 5. You get an entire semester over seven Saturdays. And I required that my graduate students read Warfighting, Marine Corps Doctrinal Publication Number 1, before the first class. Now, this is New York University in Greenwich Village. In 2005, and when I submitted the syllabus, I got a call from my department chair who said, what the heck is this? Marine Corps doctrinal publication, war fighting? You're going to teach this to our communication students? I said, yep. Uh, we argued. I won. And on the first day of class, the students arrived. They were what you would expect graduate students in Greenwich Village to look like. Uh, some of them had interesting hair of many colors. A lot of them had metal objects in their cheeks and lips and nose and other parts of their face. Uh, and as they all assembled, I began by asking a question. How many on seeing the syllabus and seeing that the first reading was a Marine Corps publication called War Fighting were confused? Raise your hand. Every hand went up. I said, how many of you were concerned? Half the hands stayed up. I said, how many of you were angry? A third of the hands stayed up. So I found the most counterculture seeming student, the one with multicolored hair and a lot of hardware in her cheeks. And I called on her and said, you were angry. And she stood up and she looked at me and she said, yes, I was angry. I said, tell me why you were angry. She said, I thought you were going to be feeding us pro-war, pro-Bush propaganda. I said, oh, OK. Have you read it? I said, yes, I have. Are you still angry? She said, no, I love this book. 
I've given copies of this book to my friends and to my family. I want to know why we didn't have this book when we started in the program. Foundations. She said, I learned more from this book than from all the other courses I've taken so far. Way to go. I knew I was on to something, and I started teaching war fighting, not only at NYU, but with civilian clients, with big banks, with big insurance companies, with big pharmaceutical companies. They all got it. They all got it and won. In 2009, I got permission from the Department of the Navy to adapt war fighting. And the power of communication is the result of that permission. So here's what I learned from war fighting. Oh, by the way, that student with the hair and the hardware, her hair now looks like anybody else's hair, I say, as someone without hair. And she no longer wears hardware in her cheeks. And she's now a professor of strategic communication at New York University. All this many years later, war fighting actually changed her. War fighting changed her in profound ways. Here's the first paragraph of Marine Corps doctrinal publication, War Fighting. War is fundamentally an interactive social process. When I put that on the wall of a civilian institution, they all look at that and they go, wow, that's really cool. That the Marines define war as fu fundamentally an interactive social process. Communication is also fundamentally an interactive social process. One of the more effective ways to understand communication is that it is interactive, it is social, and it is a process. It's not sending stuff. It's fundamentally an interactive social process. As with war, communication is thus a process of continuous mutual adaptation, of give and take, of move and counter move. As in war, just as we need to keep in mind that the enemy is not an inanimate object to be acted upon, in communication, we need to keep in mind that the audience is not an inanimate object to be acted upon, but a collection of living, breathing human beings with their own desires, their own goals, their own plans, their own capacities, their own levels of desire even to be in relationship with us. And we fail as leaders if we assume that just telling people stuff is what communication is all about. Just as it's essential in war to understand the enemy on its own terms and to not assume that the enemy thinks as we do and cares about what we care about and makes decisions the way we make decisions, similarly in communication, we should not assume that the audience thinks the way we think or cares about what we care about or makes decisions the way we do, they don't. And ineffective leaders assume that others are just like them, but the effective leaders know that others are not like them. And if we want to connect with and move people, we need to meet them where they are. We need to think the way they think. We need to understand their concerns on their terms, or else we can't possibly begin to move them. We must try to put ourselves and see ourselves through their eyes in order to anticipate what they are likely to do. If communication is an act of will directed towards a living entity that reacts, we need to be able to anticipate the reaction that is predictable and likely because we engage with them. And we make decisions in light of the audience's anticipated reactions and counteractions. In other words, we engage them because we predictably know that doing it in a certain way leads to a certain outcome. Or per war fighting, we, we ask ourselves these questions. Which factors matter most to our audience? Which does the audience care the most about? Which, if harnessed effectively, will bring the audience to think and feel and know and do what we want them to? How do we connect with them about that? Effective communication is hard because it forces us to ask these kinds of questions. And the most effective decisions in preparing communication are decisions that get us to connect with audiences on the terms the audiences care about and not based on our own personal preference. And that's a hard discipline. 
So let's move on to how you can begin to deploy this rigor, how you can begin to deploy this discipline in all of your leadership communication, whether among your own folks or with others with whom you operate or with allies or with communities or with congressional committees or with the bosses in the Pentagon. How do you deploy this rigor in order to move people a certain way? And I begin with this fundamental premise. The only reason to communicate is to change something in the people you're engaging. The only reason to communicate is to change something in the people that you are engaging. And there are four kind of changes that we can typically see in the people we are engaging. The first, we can change what people know so that they know something they otherwise would not have known. Or we can change what people think so that they think something they otherwise would not have thought. Or we can change what people feel so that they feel something they otherwise would not have felt. Or we can change what people do so that they do something they otherwise would not have done. And we can have multiple configurations and combinations of these four changes. And here's why the discipline matters. If we want to change what somebody knows, we need to engage completely differently than if we're trying to change what somebody feels. It takes a different kind of engagement to change what somebody feels compared to changing what somebody knows. If we want to change simultaneously what they know and feel, it takes both of those things. And until we have clarity about the change we seek, it's really hard to calibrate the ways to secure that change. And because means can never be considered in isolation from their purposes, until we have clarity about the change we seek, it's really hard to predictably be able to do it in an effective and efficient way. If we wanted to do all four of these changes, it takes even more. And the discipline is having clarity about the change we seek and then getting clarity about how to move the people in order to achieve that change.